Hey guys, welcome back. It's your favorite chemistry teacher. Um, in this review video, we're going to be going over periodic table, specifically topics, um, basic characteristics, properties, um, ionic versus atomic radius, and then periodic trends like atomic radius, ionization energy, um, metallic character, electronegativity, stuff like that. So before we get started, I want you to go print out this sheet. You can find it on the website. Um, I think it says Topic 2 Overview, Periodic Table. Um, print it, follow along, um, and yeah. Alright, so some basic characteristics of the periodic table. It was first kind of, the scientist that gets a lot of credit for developing the periodic table is Mendeleev. So basically what he did was he organized the elements in, by similar chemical properties being in the same group, so same up and down column. Um, he also increased them going across by, or organized them going across by increasing atomic mass, which we know is not how the periodic table is currently measured, or currently organized. So basically, um, something that's really important with him is that when he organized it by increasing atomic mass he switched them if it didn't go in the proper order to align with the similar chemical properties. Um, another really neat thing about Mendeleev is that he left blank spaces for elements that had not yet been discovered. So a space here or here, you knew that based on where it was in alignment with a column they would behave similarly. Um, <coughs> Mosley came along and organized it by increasing atomic number. So he rearranged it a little bit and so when he did it meant that the columns lined up in a better fashion. Okay, so columns are called groups. Group 1, um, alkali metals, very very reactive. Group 2, Alkali earth metals, pretty reactive. Um, groups 3 through 12, here in the middle, your transition metals. Um, when dissolved in water, they make colorful solutions unless they have a full D block. So if they have a 3D10 or a 4D10, something like that, they will not be colorful. So keep an eye on that on the AP if they ask you to explain why something is not colorful, it's usually because they have a full D. Um, okay, so then we go over to group 17, the halogens, very reactive nonmetals, the most reactive nonmetals. Group 18, noble gases, they're inert, they do not react. Um, just so we have kind of an idea, on this side you have your metals, over here your nonmetals. Metals are shiny, they have high luster, they're malleable. Um, which means you can kind of bend it, they're ductile, you can pull it into wires, um, they're very good conductors of heat and electricity. Um, Nonmetals, on the other hand, are brittle, they're dull, they don't conduct, and then don't forget about the staircase in the middle, those are your metalloids, so you start at B, you're going to draw a diagonal, so B, S, I, A, S, T, E, A, T, and then you're going to add GE and SB. Those are your metalloids, and they have properties of both um, <coughs> metals and nonmetals. Okay, um, one more thing just before we get started allotropes. In the previous topic, we talked about isotopes, atoms with the same number of protons, different number of neutrons. Allotropes are when you have something like O2, oxygen that we breathe, and O3, which is ozone. Um, <clears throat> they're bonded differently, so they have different chemical properties. Um, O2, we can breathe it safely. O3, um, not good to breathe. Okay. Alright, let's move it down here. Alright, so right here um, is kind of a box on your periodic table. Um, Number on top, atomic number, then one that's always smaller. Um, number down at the bottom, atomic mass. 
The atomic number is equal to your number of protons. It determines the identity of your atom. Um, 12.0 average atomic mass. If you were to round that number to 12, that's your mass number. Um, when it's rounded, your mass number equals the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So to find the number of neutrons, you would need to subtract the atomic mass minus the atomic number. Um, in a decimal form, that represents the average atomic mass. So basically, um, all the masses on the periodic table are an average of all the naturally occurring isotopes. And isotopes, again, atoms with the same atomic number, different atomic mass. A lot of you missed that on the midterm. Get it right. Just a suggestion. Okay, so here's an example problem that, of something that I don't, I don't know that you'll see anything like this, but you might see a variation that's a little bit harder. Um, it says calculate the average atomic mass when 75% of chlorine exists as um, Cl35, meaning the mass number, and 25% Cl37. So this is what you do. Okay, you're going to first step convert percents into decimals. So 0 0.75, 0.25. You're going to multiply times the mass. So 75% it's 35, so you do 0 0.75 times 35 plus um, 0.25 times 37. Okay, when you add those two values together, you get 35.5 AMU, atomic mass units. So you did this in honors. Um, I don't know that it would show up as simple as that, so just kind of be aware of mass number, atomic mass numbers that are on the periodic table are actually averages. Okay, next up, um, number two. So, we have atomic versus ionic radius. So, metals again are on the left side of your periodic table. They tend to lose electrons and form cations. And remember, cations are positive. Positive. See the clause? All right, so um, the ability to lose an electron is called metallic character. Nonmetals, on the other hand, gain electrons. When they gain electrons, they form anions. And the ability to gain an electron is called your nonmetallic character. Okay, so when you're trying to decide who's bigger between um, an element, an atom, and an ion. What you need to do is basically think about it's the number of protons you have and the number of electrons. So when we're working with calcium, you have 40 protons for both of these. So if the number of protons is exactly the same, then you're going to be looking at electrons. So we have calcium, um, we'll have 40 electrons, I'm sorry, this is 20. Okay, so 20 protons, 20 protons. This will have 20 electrons, and then a plus 2 charge means we lose 2, so you're going to have 18 protons. So to decide who is bigger, it's going to just be the one with more electrons. Okay, so careful when they ask for bigger or smaller. Sometimes I like to just think of like one, one of the ways. Hey, stop it, dogs, and figure it out from there. All right, so let's go with BR. So BR has, let's not mess it up this time, 35 protons, 35 protons. Negative one means you add, so you have 36 electrons. The one that's bigger, since they both have the same number of protons, 
Um, the one that's bigger will have more electrons. Okay, if you get something like K plus versus Cl minus that kind of are um, on two different levels, you want to look at, again, let's look at the number of protons. 19 protons, 17 protons. So right there, there's going to be some difference. Um, plus 1 means you have 18 electrons. Negative 1, 18 electrons. Okay. So when the number of electrons are equal, it's based on the number of protons who is bigger. So increasing the number of protons, as in with K, is going to increase your nuclear charge. An increased nuclear charge will suck in your electrons some more, making it smaller. So although it appears that K would be larger because it's on the fourth period versus the third, um, Cl is actually larger. So let's just recap. Same number of electrons dependent on protons. The more protons you have, the smaller um, it gets because there's more attraction to the nucleus. Fewer protons has less attraction, so those are bigger. Okay. Um, you can also explain that describing electron-electron repulsions and attraction to nucleus. Um, just make sure you're completely explaining your thought process. All right, so now we have some periodic trends. When you do periodic trend questions, like a free response question, one of the major things is that you have to, have to, have to mention both atoms in your response. So you would have to say something like Cl is smaller than S because, and then go through and describe, Cl has more protons, um, and so it has a greater nuclear charge with the same number of shells. So you have to go through and explain. Going down a group, this is the explanation you want to use. You want to talk about shielding. So shielding, and just imagine like you put a, something really large in between like the nucleus and the outer valence electrons, like an elephant. So if you put something large in between, those inner electrons are going to block or they're going to shield the outer electrons. Um, when those outer electrons are shielded, the attraction is going to decrease. Um, when the attraction decreases, it becomes larger and easy to remove electrons, that kind of thing. So, use this reason when explaining trends going down. Do not, at this point, talk about protons. Okay, going across, you are going to talk about protons. So going across, the number of protons increases, which you can say is the nuclear charge. So nuclear charge increases while the number of electron shells stay the same, if we're talking about the same period. Um, the greater the number of protons, the more attraction to the nucleus. This is the reason that you guys should use anytime you're describing trends across. Make sense? Alright, so atomic radius. Atomic radius is the size of your atom. Going down a group, use the snowman trend. So as you go down a group, radius will increase because you have a number of shells, an increasing number of electron shells. So you go from, in period one, you have one shell. In period two, you have two. Three, you have three, and so on. Um, the number of energy levels you have is equal to the number of the period that you're in. So going down will increase because el electron shells are being added, which increases shielding. And remember, increases shielding is the same as saying blocking outer electrons. So attraction decreases. Electrons are further from the nucleus. Okay, going across, and this is going to sound really familiar each time. Going across, the snowman falls over or is kicked over, whatever you want to think about. Um, going across, radius decreases because the nuclear charge is increasing while the number of shells remains the same. Um, increased nuclear charge increase the, is, increases the attraction between your nucleus and your outer electrons, which pulls it in. It's like a force. Okay? 
All right, last one for period or for periodic table. Okay, ionization energy. Ionization energy decreases due to shielding as you go down um, a group. So the radius is bigger. Because the radius is bigger, there are more electrons to shield the outer electrons. When you inc when you increase shielding, you weaken the attraction and it becomes easier to remove electrons. Going across, we have an increasing ionization energy due to the increased nuclear charge and increased attraction between the valence electrons and the nucleus, which make it harder to remove. Something that seems to um, pop up sometimes are common exceptions to the rule. So when you travel from group 2 to group 13, According to trends, the ionization energy, because we're going across, um, should increase, but it actually does not. So this is a common example. So Be versus B. So Be has an electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, B. Lady, what are you doing? My dog's getting into Hey! Uh-uh! Lady! She's trying to eat the... No, that's gross. Sorry. Okay. So, B has an electron configuration, 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. So, normally you would expect B to have a greater ionization energy because it's further to the right, meaning it's smaller, Oh, also don't say just because it's further to the right. So you have to say it's smaller, nuclear charge is greater, etc. So, but in actuality, it's not. So the reason why is B has more shielding from inner electrons. So these 2s electrons can shield the 2p electrons more effectively. So it becomes less attracted and easier to remove the, those electrons. Um, you can also think of it as like the 2s2 is full, so it becomes harder to remove from a full sublevel. Okay, if you can't always figure out what is happening, sometimes it'll help. I think it's really helpful actually to write the electron configuration. So, based on the configuration, you kind of see.